Alright there, geezers. Jules here from FGS, home of the Future Game Show. And you know what? Video games are something to look forward to. They're something to look forward to after a long day's graft when you get to come home, relax in a little bit of escapism. But there is sometimes a problem, and that is when video game experiences are ruined at the last minute when a publisher or outside force comes along and starts swirling their dirty fingers in your tea. This is far hotter than I thought it was. And there are countless examples of this terrible trend that have popped up over the years, from Dead Space 3 being stuffed with microtransactions and having the horror dialed all the way down in favour of action, thank you EA, to MGS5 that had a bloated ending stitched onto the experience thanks to Konami and Kojima breaking up in the school cafeteria in front of everyone. I know, it was so orcs for real. So let's have a chat about them today, as I'm Jules, this is FGS, and these are video games that were ruined at the last minute, and you know the dream by now. This is the Deep Cut with Jules Gill, baby! So expect to see games you've not heard of, thought about in a while, or need to know more about. So let's get on with this list by talking about... Rascal. Okay, so let's kick things off with a PS1 deep cut that cut deep for those that played it. Rascal, which was somehow even more obnoxious than the 3D Bobcat experience that was known as Bubsy. I mean, am I being a bit too harsh here? Well, not according to critics and the general public who list this game as being one of the worst PlayStation games ever. But you know what? In truth, there is some fantastic level design here and there. It's just a shame that you can't appreciate any of it because the controls are utterly abysmal. And that's actually the reason that I compared Rascal to Bubsy over here, and that's for the simple fact that they share one thing in common. Well, two things, because the first one is that they are utterly crap, and the second one is they both use tank controls. Platformers with tank controls. I'm not a fan! Now this, much like sticking your penis into a blender and hitting frappe, was a strange and painful choice that left players waddling about in frustration, unable to gauge distances well, and usually getting iced by enemies as they stamp about like a toddler in an effort to turn and run away. Yet it turns out that Rascal originally wasn't designed this way, and originally had controls that were very similar to Super Mario 64, and that's why the level design basically is encouraging more complex jumps and tricks to get across. But why did it get tank controls? Well, I'll tell you, friends. Whoa! Because as revealed by John Burton on his YouTube channel Game Hut, he shows by playing through a prototype of Rascal, which has the better movement, that the game actually had its controls changed thanks to Tomb Raider being such a monstrous success, which in turn convinced Rascal's publisher to mandate a control change to bring it in line with what it thought was the future of platforming. As this was done so late in the day, level designs remained unchanged to compensate compensate for this terrible decision, and so Rascal hit the market with the impact of an old man falling down face first in a car park on a cold winter's day. You just feel bad for it. I really should go and help. But speaking of helping too much, in fact, let's talk about My Little Pony Fighting is Magic. Is this a tenuous link? You better bloody believe it is. Thankfully though, we're not talking about the children's TV show and are instead focusing on the main mauling fighting game My Little Pony Fighting is Magic, a fan-made title which caused quite the stir and caught the laser-like focus of Hasbro the IP holders thanks to a charity event at EVO 2013. Now, before the event, the EVO team put out a poll which asked players to vote on what they wanted to see as the eighth game that was going to make up the event. And en masse, the bronies got their hooves stuck right on in there and voted Fighting is Magic en masse. But this rightly panicked the dev team because, surprise, surprise, this fan-made game didn't have the official license. But unfortunately for them, their pleas to not be chosen fell on deaf ears. Likely because it's kind of hard to hear through a paper mache pony head that you made just before you were fired from your job for abuse of office stationery. And so what do you think happened next? Well, if you answered that everyone had a great time and friendship is totally tubular dude or whatever the f the line is, then I'm afraid that you are sadly mistaken as Hasbro came down and obliterated fighting his magic from not only the event, but existence itself. Yet here's the thing, Hasbro up until this point were actually kind of okay with this game. They were 
were okay with it just existing, releasing to the public, and then just going about their merry way. The problem was the unrelenting and smelly fan base that decided to push it into the mainstream to the point where Hasbro couldn't ignore them. They were like, okay, uh, guys, like, I, I know it, it shouldn't exist, just I'm, I'm willing to look the other way. Stop forcing it in all of my, I, I'm gonna need blinkers. Can I borrow a pair? Ooh, they're crusty. Why? Why? So it means that if the brony community could have just shown a little bit of restraint, then maybe they would have had a fighting game worth championing instead of absolutely nothing at all. Good work. And speaking of good work, it is time for yours truly to convince you once more to subscribe to the FGS YouTube channel. Why not? And why just do it already, my friend? Because not only will you stay up to date for all of the deep cuts with Jules Gill, baby, every single Friday, but you'll be able to stay up to date with all the daily gaming content that my colleagues put out as well. But there is a brand new reason to do so because the Spring Showcase has just been announced for March this year, and there's going to be a ton of brand new games, exclusives, a massive live event, and you should definitely be a part of that. So subscribe, come watch it, and who knows, there might be a few surprises along the way. I don't know what this means. Anyway, before I rip my nose off, let's talk about Command & Conquer Tiberium Twilight. Okay, so it was only a matter of time before EA shoved their way into a list like this, screaming me, 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 as they just spit flecks of vodka-infused spittle all over the place. Such is their want to be. The big balloon baboon buffoon that they are, who basically just loves just shoving their meaty fist into everyone else's pies. Bad times. They forced the Mass Effect Andromeda team to use the Frostbite engine, which had been designed to solely work with FPS titles. They are the ones responsible for the marketing of Brutal Legend hiding all the RTS elements, meaning that fans looking for that slant of gaming got absolutely burned. And of course, when it came to Star Wars The Old Republic, they pushed the game out the door early without any meaningful endgame content, resulting in their second biggest Star Wars-based backlash. Yet in amongst all of these high-profile clattering sits Command & Conquer Day. Iberium Twilight, a game which was so close to being perfect, but unfortunately EA came in, they barreled right in, and they messed up everything. You see, originally Tiberium Twilight was going to be an online-only version of Command & Conquer 3's multiplayer that was designed for a Chinese market in which cyber cafes are still absolutely huge. Now, this quick-fire, quick-match product would allow players to bash out a few matches and then get on with their day. As a result, the framework of C and C3 was manipulated to suit battles on a smaller scale, effectively becoming a rapid-fire skirmish title. Had things ended here, Tiberium Toilet would have been a monumental success because it was a product designed for a very specific market and it was catering to them well. But EA saw all of this and just went, well, I'll tell you what, I've written a little play. Wow, I love what you've done with the place. You've streamlined things to a T. Good work, my friend. I've just got a few small suggestions, though. What if we added in a ton of bloat, an overblown single-player campaign that kind of doesn't work, and also all the mechanics? Let's just change them. Let's just change all of them. Oh, right. Um, that sounds awful. You're right. Let's add DRM in as well. Good idea. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that. What just happened? What just happened? Thank you, thank you. What resulted was a game that was at odds with itself. A game that was designed to allow players to hop in for a few matches, that was now stuffed with a rushed single player mode and now carried mechanics that didn't fit its cut down approach. And fans, well, they thoroughly raked the game over the coals upon its release. And it's a real shame that those embers were likely kept hot with the frustrated devs who basically had to bow down to the mighty EA and change what was once a brilliant idea for a game into something that was so substandard and actually just kind of was a real bum note for the franchise. And speaking of squeezing and appeasing, let's talk about King's Quest Mask of Eternity because I tell you friends, if you're in the market for a game with comedy, outlandish puzzles, brilliant writing and more ways to fail than taking a multiple choice test on quantum physics on opposite day, then you need to check out the King's Quest series. This is Peak Sierra Entertainment, a brilliantly silly collection of point and click adventure games that is as amusing as they are fiendishly obtuse at points. Yet amongst all of these great titles sits one rather tragic tale, and that is King's Quest Mask of Eternity. This unfortunately drew the attention of Bob and Jan Davidson, who at the time ran Davidson and Associates, who were part of the same company family as Sierra, and they were known as CUC Software. 
Now, good old Bob and Jan were good old Christian folk, and they didn't like the bad old violence on show and the good old game of Mask of Eternities. So they turned to their good old-fashioned company and said, we should put some good old Christian values into this good old Christian game. And Cuck Software went, stop talking like that, please. Please, Jules, stop. Well, relent. Just make your own Christian version of this game. Get out of my sight. What followed was a mess of rewriting, removal of offensive material, and a sanitization that would have even a germaphobe going, oh, that's a bit much, all of which turned Mask of Eternity into a masquerade of itself. Now, all seemed to spell doom for the title, but then a twist of fate. Bob and Jan went out of business. I'm sure it was God's plan to take away this Christian message from the gaming market. He works in mysterious ways. And suddenly control was given back to Roberta Williams, the godmother of point and click games. Unfortunately though, there wasn't enough time and resources to save Mask of Eternity and it hit the market in a buggy and unfocused state. And it's actually here that the last minute change that ruined the game comes into play. It wasn't actually Bob and Jan sticking their good old Christian ore in, no, no, no. Instead, it was the decision to carry on with the project after they were removed. It would have been totally better to scrap the entire idea or start in completely afresh with a brand new release date. But alas, that's not what happened. Things were rushed, corners were cut, and what we got was possibly the lowest point in all of the King's Quest series. And that's sad, because it basically iced the entire franchise for a good couple of decades, from like 1998, I think the last one was, and then it was 2015 when it got a little bit of a revamp. That's a long time to wait. And speaking of transformation jobs that didn't exactly cut the mustard, let's talk about Transformers Universe. Now, when it comes to the Transformers franchise, there doesn't seem to be a middle ground when it comes to the quality of their video games. Either they are stone-cold classics like the War for Cybertron titles, or they are rusted to the core experiences like Beast Wars Transmetals. Seriously, if you've never played this game, you experience at least 10% more joy in your life than I ever will. Annoyingly though, Transformers Universe could have been up there with some of the greats, but thanks to a last minute course correction, we saw the game going da -da -da -da. face turn here, except on the one side, you've got a golden god, and on the other side, you've got somebody who is milking pus into your eclairs. Enjoy that image. This all took place in 2013, right after a supremely successful testing phase had closed for Transformers Universe, and upon seeing the reams of positive feedback and people praising this MMORPG for feeling so close to being finished despite it still being in closed beta, Jagex did exactly what you think they would do. They threw their hands up in the air and said, well, this is and went back to the drawing board. Did they play the same game we did? They also appointed a new creative director by the name of Alex Durakov, who previously had worked on Grand Theft Auto 2 and who proceeded to change, well, just about everything. Now, it's unclear whether it was Alex or Jagex who were behind the true driving force behind all the changes, but when Transformers Universe came back onto the scene in 2014, it wasn't flying the MMORPG banner, but was instead covered in a hasty MOTA or motor paint job. Now, despite having more mmms and ohs than your passionless X going through a conversation with you, these two genres are very, very different, and it heavily pissed off the fan base who was invested in one and not so much in the other. A sudden change also impacted gameplay from a technical perspective, because now it had numerous bugs, frequent crashes of both the game and the entire servers, and had a frame rate so low that it made slideshows look bloody brisk. And it was this late game decision that cost Transformers Universe, well, everything, because in just a few months, this game was dead. But let's move on from a title that died to a title that came back from the dead, only to die again. Ugh, it's time to talk about the Lost Descent game. Right, my friends, let's talk about a metaphorical blast from the literal past as we discuss Nausea Simulator FPS Descent. But here, FPS stands for <laughs> Please stop, because this game gave me such the tummy ache when I was a child. Still, if you can hold on to your stomach, Descent is one of the best old school shooters that you can get your hands on, and it's a shame that this Six Degrees of Freedom shooter was utterly caged thanks to the meddling actions of a publisher by the name of Little Orbit. Now, originally Little Orbit was the hero of the story as they stepped in to help Descendant Studios publish their new crowdfunded Descent game, Descent Underground. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, oh boy, howdy, a new Descent game, I'd better go on to Steam and wishlist it right now. Well, hold on, little fella, because the game that you'll find on the marketplace right now is not a Descent game. It doesn't even carry the same name because for some weird reason, which I will explain to you now, it is called 
Ships That Fly Underground, which has the acronym of STFU. Groan! Actually, you know what? Hold on to that groan, because it turns out that Little Orbit used their six degrees of freedom to pivot the game in one specific direction. NFT and blockchain mechanics. I know, right? It's like getting whiplash for how not descent this is. Oh, and by the way, do you want another neck injury? Because let's turn this way and look over at the fact that the game publisher that tried to put out this STFU themselves got fleeced by the NFT company that they were working with to the tune of $700,000. Ooh, an NFT scam? My gosh, I'm shocked. I'm so ghasted that I've gone a flabber. I mean, how could you not see this coming? I guess I shouldn't really be laughing, though, as thanks to the actions of Little Orbit and their lawsuit against Descendant Studios, oh yeah, that also happened, we now have a game that nobody wants to play and zero new Descent games. Cool. <sighs> right, okay, I'm drained now by talking about all these disappointments, so let's really amp it up for the last one and talk about Battle Cruiser 3000 AD. And so we close on the monumental catastrophe that is Battle Cruiser 3000 AD, a game that at one point in time was hailed by critics as the last game you will ever need. And yet, thanks to a series of bungling buffoonery, ended up being the last game you'd ever want to play. To call Battlecruiser 3000 AD an ambitious game is kind of like saying that Thatcher closing the mines here in Wales was a bit of an annoyance to the workforce, aka a monstrous understatement, as this really was a game that promised to have it all and then do ten times more. And this was all down to the rather overblown and uh, often exaggerated remarks made by Derek K. Smart, the sole developer of the project, who alongside promising that his space simulation game would be far deeper than anything else on the market, also claimed that his game had a neural network that allowed the AI of his title to perform supremely complex actions. Now, as you can imagine, that last statement definitely caught the attention of the gaming public, but it also caught the attention of an ex-NASA scientist who said, and this is maybe paraphrasing him here, uh, nah mate, you're chatting utter b his name was Keith Zabalui, by the way. And Keith's actual statement was that if such a thing were in this game, that Derek would be in the Computing Hall of Fame. Yet this wasn't the only overegged story that Big D was cooking up, because despite BC3K being nowhere near completion, he reportedly handed over some code to Take-Two, who was publishing the title, along with the message that the game was done except for the manual. Now, reports vary wildly on who was really to blame here, but maybe saying that the game was good to go months or even even years before that being true was a bit of a blunder. Especially since it led Take-Two to take him at his word and publish the game far before it was in a ready state, and critics and fans alike utterly mauled this title. And rightly so, it was a broken, unfinished, buggy mess, and yes, things probably could have been delivered a little better had Derek maybe curtailed his promises just a little bit. However, unfortunately, that's not the case, and as a result, this miscommunication ruined any chances of BC3K performing well out of the gate. Thankfully, though, it has received a ton of updates since, but for many, including Derek, who took Take Two to court over the matter, the damage was most definitely done. And there we go, my friends. Those were the video games that were ruined at the last minute. I hope you enjoyed that, and let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules, and if you want to follow me on the social medias, you can do so by following me over here, or you can follow my lovely editor Mark over here as well, my friends. Hope that you are treating yourself well. And remember, even though we can put ourselves into situations where we feel that we are ruining them at the last minute, just take some time out, my dude. Take some time. Take a personal five. Relax, readjust, reevaluate the situation, and then approach it with a better mindset and fresh energy. Sometimes barreling forward is not the right way to solve a problem. Sometimes getting what you can in order and then attacking the problem is the best way. So take that time, take that bit of self-reflection and allow yourself to relax. You deserve to relax, okay? As always, I've been Jules, you have been awesome, never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. ...able to battle enemies and level up their character. Oh, you... Focus properly. ...milking pus into your eclairs. Enjoy that image. My tummy's gone a bit funny after that. I wrote it, why did I write that?